is recording is going to start soon, so I'm going to wait for that. Looks like it's recording. Okay. So now we are moving on to chapter 13. Obviously, we just finished chapter 10, so you don't have to be a mathematician to notice that we have skipped chapters 11 and 12. Um, that is very interesting stuff that we've skipped, so you can look at it if you want, but you do not have to. So chapter 13 is the beginning of my favorite part of this semester. Um, because prior to this, everything we've talked about has either been molecular or cellular. We keep talking about things that happen in cells, or at the most, you could sort of talk about genetics and um, talk about how that happens in an, an organism's body. Right? It originates from the cell, but it changes the body. So finally, we're getting to the portion of the semester where we look at biology when we look outside of an organism, and we're looking at multiple organisms. Like We're looking at the big picture. This is my kind of stuff. So hopefully, if you're like me, this is really about to get interesting. But anyway, let's get started. We are doing Chapter 13. Like I said, this is all about how populations evolve. Um, later, you're going to learn the difference between the word population and community and um, ecosystem, organism, things like that. So yes, we are looking at how populations evolve. Uh, we choose this chapter because it really just gives the overall picture. But you could also look at the way other things evolve, and we might talk about that later. But for the exam and for, for this semester, uh, this course, you should focus on how populations evolve. So here we go. This time we will go ahead and start off with the guessing game. Well, I guess we can't because you can't. Uh, it'll be too long for me to wait for you to answer, but I'll go ahead and give it to you real quick. So usually we play the guessing game, and I would ask you what this is, and hopefully you would see that that's a little tomato. And your book, the point your book is making here is that because of artificial selection, you know, because we have humans have bred um, crops. Things have changed, right? So this is what tomatoes used to look like. And if it was not for the fact that we artificially breed things, then we wouldn't have the tomatoes that we have today. And your book was pointing that out. And if you still have independent work to do, that is, in my opinion, an interesting interesting topic to look into. Like what did food used to look like? Bananas used to look a lot different. Carrots used to look a lot different. Watermelons used to look a lot different. So you can look that up if you want. Does somebody have a question? I don't see your screen, and I left and rejoined. Ooh, I'm glad you mentioned that. All right, let me get back to it. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. And let's see. All right, hopefully now you can see. Can, um, I'll just give it a couple seconds. If someone cannot see, go ahead and let me know. All right, good to go. So anyway, luckily so far anything you've seen or didn't see wasn't too important. I was talking about this little tomato right here and how um, humans have changed food through artificial selection. So you can look into that if you want for um, independent work. Here, um, I'm sure, I hope you can all recognize that these are cheetahs. And the reason your book brings cheetahs up is because they've nearly gone extinct twice. And because of that, they have very little bit of a uh, very little genetic diversity. And you're going to learn what that means in this chapter. And you're going to learn why that's important in this chapter. And here we've got a kid scratching their head. Your book points out that, you know, because of evolution in um, pest insects, we are having um, pesticide resistance in things like head lice and uh, bed bugs and things like that. So this is just an, uh, a real life example of how evolution is currently happening and how in this case it is negatively affecting people. So that's it for the guessing game. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, do you have any questions before we get started? All right, like I've mentioned before, we are a little bit behind. Um, one, because we missed a week of class, and two, I just, um, I guess I'm slower when I lecture online. So I'm going to do my best to move quickly. So I'll remind you, like I've always said anyway, read the chapter before we have our lectures. That way you can be prepared to ask me questions. 
um, at the appropriate time in the lecture. And I'm going to try to move quickly. You guys just, uh, you know, let me know if you have any questions. And here we go. Uh, another thing you can see, there's a lot of bullet points in this chapter. There's a lot of stuff to cover. So this is going to be a long chapter. Um, and let's get started. The first thing we're going to talk about, as you can obviously see here, is the diversity of life. So natural selection, um, evolution gave us the diversity of life, so to speak. Um, so before we talk about how that happened, let's just talk about the diversity of life itself. Um, the first thing we're talking about is the term taxonomy. I'm sure a lot of you have heard it before. Even if you haven't heard it before, I'm sure you just probably knew that there, this, this science existed. And this is the branch of biology that deals with identifying naming and classifying species. So, you know, if you were to discover a species, you, part of it would be giving it a name, but you also need to understand, you know, what, obviously what genus it is, what is, what, excuse me, which genus it's in, which family, um, so on and so forth. Um, and under this umbrella of taxonomy, uh, we use this thing called the Linnaean system. And that is the method of naming species and it's a hierarchical classification of species into broader groups of organisms. Now on this slide for the exam, this is really what you need to worry about. Maybe understand the, um, the definition of taxonomy. Just know that taxonomy is the branch of identifying, naming, and classifying species. As far as the Linnaean system, we're gonna learn a little bit more about that, but what you see here on this slide is not specifically gonna be on the exam. Are there any questions? on this slide. All right, so let's talk about taxonomy. Let's talk about naming and classifying the diversity of life. So again, like I said back in the earlier slide, we're gonna talk about the Linnaean system. Um, specifically, when we give a species a name, it has a two-part Latinized name, and I'm sure you all have heard of that, like Homo sapien, right? You've all heard that, that's what we are. And this two-part Latinized name is known as a binomial. The only reason you need to know what a binomial is is so you understand what that word is when I use it later. Um, also, it would help you to understand how the name's broken down. Obviously, the bi is a good reminder that it's a two-part name because the bi means two. So let's talk about those two parts really quick. The first part is the genus. So again, for Homo sapiens, that means Homo would be our genus, um, and your book defines a genus as a group of closely related species. Um, you do not need to memorize the definition of a genus. We'll talk a little bit more about the groups, like genus, species, family, kingdom. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but for now, just know that if we're talking about the Linnaean system and this binomial name, the first part is the genus, and the second part is the actual species within the genus. So again, using um, us as an example, Homo would be the genus for, for us humans and uh, the other closely related species. And the second one would be sapien, and that is our species within a genus. Now your book gives this example of the large cats, um, the large cat genus called Panthera. And then we'll give you some species examples here on the next slide. But are there any questions so far? All right. You might get a test question where you get a scientific name that you presumably never have heard of, and it might say, what genus is this um, species in? And the answer is going to be in the name, right? So because the genus is the first part of the binomial name. So let's move forward. The two-part system, excuse me, again, like I said earlier, the two parts together is how we name a species. And going back to the book example, the scientific name for a leopard is Panthera partis. So, like we said, genus species, you know that part. Here's the part I haven't told you before, and, and if you've had, if you sent me papers with independent work where you use the species name, I've already told you this, but now you're officially being told. So when we write these species down, um, the first name, the genus, that's always capitalized. And the second letter is not capitalized. So it's capitalized, not capitalized. And in addition, the whole thing, as you can see, are in italics. So that's how you write a species name. Genus, species, uppercase, lowercase, whole thing in italics. 
Now, if you were handwriting this, you wouldn't italicize it. You could just underline it instead, but there we go. Are there any questions about these two bullet points or anything we've covered so far? Again, for the exam, you might get a question where you get a scientific name and I might ask you the genus or the species, or maybe I'll just give you four wrong versions of um, scientific names and you pick out which one is the correct one. But anyway, if there's no questions on these two bullet points, let me address this one, because you might think to yourself, why do we do this? Like, why do we, why even come up with these scientific names? What's up with Panthera partis? Why don't we just say leopard? Well, the biggest thing, in my opinion, is that it solves the problem of ambiguity of common names. And I'll give you an example. This is a better, <laughs> this is a better example for um, people where I'm from, but here we go anyway. I'll give it a couple seconds to see if anybody can guess, but does anybody know what kind of fish this is? Obviously, there's the scientific name, but does anybody know by looking what type of fish that is? I'll give you a hint. You can catch it down south, and you've seen it on your menus. It's mahi-mahi, isn't it? Exactly. Perfect. Mahi-mahi. That is one way you could say it. And But this, again, getting into why we use this scientific name, around the world, this is the, the actual name of this fish. No matter where you are, this is the actual name that all the biologists have agreed upon but then you get like she said mahi mahi which is actually the pacific term for it and that's actually caught on on menus around here when um when i was younger at least down south it was on the menus as dolphin but that obviously confused a lot of people especially the tourists so they're like well we're eating dolphin that's not good so i think because of that they switched to the um the set the, the pacific name mahi mahi uh if you go to mexico and Latin America, it's known as a Dorado. If you go to Japan, it's known as a Shira, so on and so forth. So obviously this is not a fish class, so you do not need to memorize all this. The point here is that if you have a, an animal, a common animal from around the world, it's going to have all kinds of different common names. And this is why we go through having a scientific name. So any questions so far? All right. Moving forward, like we said earlier, this scientific name also puts it in a hierarchical category. Um, and what I mean by that, um, taxonomy extends to progressively broadened categories. So, for example, species is the most specific thing we have. And then, like we said earlier, when we're talking about the scientific name, a bunch of similar species are put together in um, a genus or genre. And then if you have a bunch of similar genus or genre right those are in the same family a bunch of the same family together would be in orders and then classes phyla kingdoms domains so on and so forth the best way for you to memorize this in my opinion is just memorize it in order like you see right here just memorize this either most specific to broad so you can remember excuse me memorize species genus family order class phylum kingdom domain or you can memorize it the other way, from big to small, right? There's three domains. Everything is in there. From there, you've got kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So you do need to memorize that. There will be like one test question on that, maybe two. So hopefully it won't be hard for you. And in my opinion, it's not very important. So, you know, if, you, if you're studying it and you're worried about it, just remember you're not going to lose many points if you get it wrong. And you could probably do without this knowledge for the rest of the semester and understand, right? This isn't um, any kind of cumulative knowledge. Also, I'll point out this slide right here is just an example of this um, particular species. So where it says species, Panthera partis, and then Panthera, Felidae, Carnivora, you do not need to memorize all that. Only thing you should know is domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So are there any questions on what we've covered so far? All right, moving forward. This is another picture of everything I just showed you, or another example of what we just talked about, but this picture is not from your book. So again, you start big and get small. So the domain eukarya, that's all the eukaryotes. Um, that includes all the animals, plants, fungi, protists, all that stuff. And then it gets smaller and smaller as you get more specific. 
I will. I like that your book, your book points this out that the criteria used to put these different species in these different categories. And I'm backing it up right here, right? Like when someone decided, you know, this particular squirrel, that's where it belongs. It's in this species and this genus and this family, so on and so forth. It is ultimately arbitrary, meaning humans have decided that. As a matter of fact, if you look it up, I'm gonna back up one more time. If you look this up, sometimes it's not quite that simple. A lot of times, like if you look up a plant, and uh, if you Wikipedia a plant, it won't just give you this, domain, kingdom, phylum, subphylum, or excuse me, there we go. It won't just give you domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Sometimes there's subphylums or uh, super classes, things like that. Things that you do not need to worry about in this class. But my point here is that it is ultimately arbitrary. Um, after you learn about processes by which the diversity of life have evolved, so evolution, uh, we will then introduce you to a classification system based on the understanding of evolutionary relationships. None of this will be on the exam, but what this is all basically saying is everything's ultimately arbitrary, but we do have a new system that we start that we've been using that is less arbitrary and it's based on evolutionary relationships. So when we say things are related, like this species is closely related to that species or this genus is closely related to that genus, it's becoming less arbitrary. And again, you'll see later in the semester what that means. Now, if you download this PowerPoint and click this link, there's a little video you can watch about taxonomy, but that is it on um, taxonomy. Does anybody have any questions on taxonomy and classifying species and how to write a species name or excuse me, a scientific name? All right, so before we talk about um, evolution, I kind of give you a little bit of history lesson again. The explanation of the origin of diversity of life is the evolutionary theory. So what we mean by that is, again, um, the diversity of life. So all the different species we have, right? It's, we're very diverse. And the reason, the way we explain this in biology is evolution. This is why evolution is so important. One of the reasons, and you'll see some other ones as we go through this, uh, go through this chapter. So, this evolution theory was proposed by Charles Darwin. You should know that. You should know that name. That'll come up again. He proposed it in his book called "On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection." That book was published in 1859. It would be handy to know the name of this book, um, but I'm not going to ask you on the exam because this isn't a history class. But yeah, that was a very important book, probably one of the most important books in biology. But your uh, textbook does point out that even though Darwin proposed this evolutionary theory and talked about natural selection, he was not the first person to try to explain the origins of life. Um, so before we get into that, I should point out too that, well, no, I won't even, we'll just... Let's just dive into it. So let's talk about the idea of a fixed species. So again, this is almost like a little history lesson, sort of like we did with um, Mendel when we talked about genetics and sort of like Watson and Crick when we talked about the structure of DNA. We're doing it again, but this time it's in the um, context of evolution. So we'll talk about Aristotle first, this guy right here. He stated that species are fixed permanent forms and do not change over time. So the ancient Greeks back then, that was the idea. That was the scientific reasoning, and everybody went along with it, right? So there is no evolution in this thought. Nothing has changed. Everything has always been the way it is, and nothing will ever change. And a similar thought is still believed with a, a literal translation, excuse me, a literal translation of the Bible, right? So the Judeo-Christian um, culture says the same thing, right? It says... God created everything. This is the way he created it. Um, it didn't change into that form. That's just the way he created it. Now, if you download this PowerPoint, you can click both of those pictures to get um, little short videos about both. And it's been a while, since, to be honest, it's been a little bit since I've clicked this and watched that video. But if I remember correctly, it's a nice little video that kind of explains um, creation from the Bible's point of view but in the context of evolution. So I don't know. If you're interested, you could watch those videos. But are there any questions so far? 
there are questions about this on the study guide. I don't know if I'm going to have them on the exam yet, but basically, if anything, like the like you see in the study guide, you should know that Aristotle and the Bible, you know, they both they both say there is no evolution, right? Things are the way they are, and they've been that way since they were created. But then in 1600s, we had a change. Um, religious scholars at prior to this had estimated that Earth is about 6,000 years old, right? And that's still kind of the some of the religious um, the religions say that the Earth is 6,000 years old. But again, things started changing in the 1600s. So the idea that all living species came into being relatively recently and unchanging had dominated for centuries. Um, Meanwhile, naturalists were grappling with the interpretation of fossils. So here's where it gets interesting is this third bullet point. Everything prior to this bullet point is just saying, back in the day, we used to think the earth was young and things have always been the same way. It is at this point that we start seeing things and start questioning things. Because, like it says right here, people were finding fossils and they had no idea what it means. Um, really quickly, your book does point out that a fossil is an imprint or remains of an organism that lived in the past. You do not need to know the definition of a fossil. A little bit later in this some chapter, we'll talk about some examples of fossils, and you'll need to be able to recognize a fossil when you see an example of one, but um, that's it. So any questions so far? We're about to get more into this bullet point when we move forward, but does anybody have any questions so far? All right. So again, we're still talking about the puzzle, uh, the the fossils here. Some of you hopefully were thinking, well, why was that confusing? The the fact that we found fossils, what did that? Why was that a game changer? So let's talk about it. Fossils were thought to be the remains of living creatures. So meaning, back in the day when they found a fossil, they thought that that species, that creature that they had found in the fossil, was alive somewhere on Earth. Because prior to this, again, they thought nothing had changed. There was no evolution. There was no extinction, there was just creation, and that's the way it's always been. So your book gives this great example. People kept finding these things they called snake stones because they look a lot like snakes, like a coiled up snake, except none of them ever had a head. So they couldn't understand it. Why do every single one of these fossils not have a head? So people obviously started questioning, could some fossils represent species that had become extinct? And I know, again, for us, that might sound weird because we, we know extinction's happening. Uh, happen. We know that things are going extinct in our own lifetime, so to us that's probably not a big thing, but back then it was. Um, does anybody... Okay, sorry. And the snake stone thing, that's just an example, so again, that won't be on the exam. Are there any questions so far? All right. So again, we're still moving forward through our little history of um, evolution. There were discoveries in the 1800s, a lot of them, the really made people think and start changing their thinking. The book, one of your book examples is this fossil right here. It is a gigantic sea creature called ichthyosaur, which means fish lizard. And this thing right here really convinced a lot of people that extinctions had occurred, which to me is interesting because the sea is huge and deep and there's still other species we haven't found. So I don't know, obviously we know that extinctions have occurred. We do know this is extinct. But I don't know, if I were a thinker back in the day, I would just think, okay, you found these fossils, but maybe they're still alive somewhere and we don't know it. But anyway, this also is just an example and there's nothing to know for the exam. If you download this PowerPoint and click this picture, there's a little short video you can watch on the ichthyosaur. Are there any questions so far? Okay. Now we're getting into the really relatively recent history of evolution here these this last bullet point right here <clears throat> so again with the fossils we had naturalists that were comparing these fossils that were that they were finding <clears throat> with actual living species so again we're moving forward in the history of evolution so now at this point people have at least come to terms with the idea that there had been extinctions so now knowing that and looking at these fossils they're looking at them like all right well i can see that this fossil is a lot like this thing, this species that is alive. However, it is also very different in this way. So there is a lot of studying going on comparing fossils with living uh, creatures. And then in the early 1800s, <clears throat> excuse me, 
French naturalist Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck suggested that the best explanation for all this stuff we talked about in this bullet point right here um, was that life evolves. So maybe know his name. Yeah, go ahead and know his name for the exam just in case because Lamarck is the first person who's credited for suggesting that life evolves. You don't, mem you don't need to memorize the fact that it was the early 1800s or that he was French or that his full name was Jean-Baptiste Jean de Lamarck. For this, uh, for this class, you could just think Lamarck was the first person credited for, um, for saying that life evolves, basically. So are there any questions so far? We're going to talk a little bit more about his theory um, in the coming slides. All right. So let's talk about what he explained and proposed. Um, he proposed that evolution is the refinement of traits that equip organisms to perform successfully in their environment. So he was kind of on the right track with that one. However, he also said, by using or not using body parts, an individual may develop certain traits it passes on to offspring. Now, even though he didn't use this example, I'll use this example. This would be like saying, um, I don't know, if, if you work out a lot, and you're doing curls a lot and you have big biceps and your your spouse or whoever you're having a child with is also working out a lot and doing curls and has big biceps that your offspring would probably have slightly larger biceps than other people because you used it so hopefully you read that or hear that and think that is absolutely crazy because it is so his idea of how species evolve was mistaken so his idea that they evolve and that it had to do with their environments, that is correct. His idea of how it happened by using or not using body parts, that was incorrect. So his proposal that species evolve as a result of their interactions between organisms and their environment helped set the stage for Darwin. So this is one of the reasons why he's still famous and we still talk about him because again, he was credited with the first person to propose evolution in general. <clears throat> and also his ideas were kind of along the right track. So. Um, Darwin kind of stood on his shoulders in, in some sense. So are there any questions so far? All right, <clears throat> excuse me. All these details, you do not need to know them for the exam. There's a study guide question in which someone, uh, they say something like, if, evol if evolution happened this way, you know, who, who would have proposed it? So you might get an example, like the example I just gave you of somebody working out and their biceps getting bigger and then their children's having larger biceps. If I give you an example like that, you should recognize that as a Lamarckian view of evolution. But all these details right here, that's just to help um, explain what we're talking about. So that is it for the um, background, basically. Actually, let me back up one step, sorry. I don't remember if your book talked about it or not, but another great example a real example of what he believed, what Lamarck believed, was giraffes. Um, you do not need to know this for the exam, but it's just a great example of how he thought. So he correctly believed that giraffes were, you know, kind of stretching their neck, trying to get to leaves and trees. Uh, and, and because of their environment, obviously the longer their neck, the better suited they were for their environment. The more they ate, um, the more they were able to pass along their genes, right? So it was good to have a long neck. But in his way of thinking, by stretching their neck their whole lives, they had offspring that also had slightly stretched necks. And over time, you know, the necks got longer and longer because they were stretching them. And that is not the way it works. So we're going to talk now about how it actually works when we talk about Charles Darwin. So any questions on anything we've covered so far? All right. Your book is going to continue on with the history lesson theme, so to speak. So again, like we learned about Mendel with genetics and Watson and Crick with the DNA, we're going to do the same thing with Charles Darwin. You're going to kind of learn what he went through, how he went through it, what he observed, which is good because hopefully it'll help you understand evolution. But also it's good because it also reinforces the scientific method because the whole thing starts with um, observations. So let's jump in. Before I get started, um, I'm going to read all this. We'll talk about it, and then I'll tell you what should be on the exam. So 
If you're taking notes, don't feverishly be taking notes right now. Not yet. So Charles Darwin. He was born in 1809 on the very same day that Abraham Lincoln was born, like same, you know, at the same day, same year in February, um, Abraham Lincoln was born. He was fascinated with nature as a boy, which makes sense. Um, he has a foundation of with nature. He was in medical school when he was younger, but he quit because he found medicine boring and surgery horrifying, which makes sense because back then, you know, they weren't putting people to sleep, so surgery was really horrifying. Um, when he quit medical school, he went to become a clergyman, which I love this. This is like the perfect storm of somebody who would uh, figure out natural selection, right? He has all this meadow, his nature and medical background, but he also has some religious background. Um, and then at the age of 22, he began his voyage on the HMS Beagle that helped frame his theory of evolution. So now that I'm looking at this, none of this necessarily will be on the exam. This is just a good background. Um, if you download the PowerPoint and click this little picture of the HMS Beagle, you can see a little bit of a video on it. There's a study guide question about the HMS Beagle, but you do not need to memorize the name of his boat or the boat that he was on, excuse me. Are there any questions so far? All right, let's talk about his journey. Uh, so like I said earlier, he went on this at 22. He went on this journey on the boat called the Beagle. Um, the Beagle was a survey ship and his job was basically making maps. Um, Darwin, obviously, they didn't spend all the time on boat. They would get off at times. You would have to. And plus, they were making maps of the coast. So they were close to the coast anyway. So when he was on shore, he spent a lot of time exploring. He was collecting fossils. And also living plants and animals, which to me sounds really fascinating just because obviously I'm into biology. But even if you're not into biology, you have to think about that. If you're from England and it's way back in the day, you're going to places most people have never been before. And you're seeing things that most people in England have never seen before. These plants and animals that you've just never seen. Or at most, maybe you've seen pictures and drawings of them, perhaps a couple of specimens in a, in a zoo or something like that. But... This must have been really fascinating for him um, back in the day. So again, he was exploring and collecting, collecting stuff, and he was also keeping detailed journals of his observations. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in his journals his, of his observations, he was noting characteristics of plants and animals that made them well-suited to diverse environments. So again, he was going all over the world. I'll show you a picture where later, <clears throat> excuse me, on the map. So he was seeing a lot of different environments and he was seeing a lot of different organisms. And he was noting, again, the characteristics that made them suited for the environment. Um, again, none of this will be on the exam. This is just setting things up for you to understand how he came to his ideas a little bit later. But are there any questions so far? All right, <clears throat> there's the map I was talking about. So you can see that he started in England, went down the South American, coast went over here across the pacific went down here between new zealand and australia anyway he went around the world basically little side note that this definitely won't be on the exam i just find it slightly interesting darwin australia is up here but darwin never went to that part of australia but anyway this little box right here is the important part for what we're going to talk about later he went to a place called the galapagos islands and i'm going to talk later about why that is so significant um, also, again, this is just for your own knowledge. None of this is going to be on the exam. Again, there's, a, there's the uh, Galapagos Islands. You can see there are all kinds of different shapes. Hopefully you can kind of tell that some of them are a little bit taller than others and steeper than others, but that will all come into play later when we talk about it. So let's talk about Darwin's observations. We said he was taking notes and making observations and writing them down, so let's talk about what they were. His observations indicated that geographic proximity is a better predictor of relationship among organisms, excuse me, organisms than a similarity of environment. So before I give you the book example, you could just think, um, I don't know, if he had a plant, let me back up here. <clears throat> Let's say he found a plant um, right here when he came ashore, right? in South America. 
And he noticed that even though that was a really rocky sort of cold place, he noticed that the plants there were very much more similar to the plants here in a completely different environment than they were to plants, I don't know, here. The point being is even though you have a different environment, like here, this is really rocky, it's mountainous, that's where the Andes are. Um, even though the environment might be different, what's more important is how close these things are. So a South American species is gonna be more like another South American species than it is going to be somewhere else. Or another example would be if there's a plant in the deserts of North America, it's probably gonna be more like the plants in the grasslands of North America than it will be in the deserts of Africa. So even though we're still talking about the desert of North America and the desert of Africa, the point is these two things are closer because they are, well, because they're closer, they are more similar. Now, for your book example, plants and animals living in temperate regions of South America more closely resemble the species living in tropical regions of that continent than species living in similarly temperate regions of Europe. So again, all this stuff to say geographic proximity is a better predictor of relationships than similarities of environment. And that's all you should take from this for the exam and for understanding the rest of what we're what I'm about to teach you. So are there any questions so far? All right. I have a question. How like how is that because that just doesn't seem like logical you would think that like desert type critters would be the same you know what i mean like i would think that there would be more similarities in like if they have similar environments than just because they're geographically close and that's what we'll talk about later that's a great question and it's basically because think about like if some new species of plant originated here, it would just spread throughout South America. And as it spreads, you know, this one species, right? And as it spreads through South America and it gets to these in different environments, yes, it'll evolve to change to be adapted to that environment, but they all came from that one original species that started there. Unlike a, spe a plant species that might start here in Africa, similar environment, but as it spreads, it's going to encounter different environments. And yes, it'll change. It'll be different than that original plant. But because it did come from the original plant, because it's a, um, how do I put it, like a variation on the original theme, that's what's going to make these more closely related than these. And again, that's just an overview. We'll talk more about that later in the, in the chapter. So that's a great question. It's all about the fact that Basically, it all originated with one organism, and everything evolved from there. So, and again, we're going to talk more about that, so let's kind of get into that right now. The South American fossils that he did find that were clearly examples of species that were different from living ones, right? So he knew he was dealing with um, extinct species, he could tell. Um, but they were distinctly South American in resemblance to living plants and animals of that continent. So usually if we had the time and if we were in person, we could play the little guessing game and I would ask you guys if you know what these animals are. And usually people do get them. They would say toucan or iguana or capybara or whatever. But the point here is actually these represent animals from fossils that are actually extinct. Point being, he was looking at fossils. He's like, clearly these things are not alive, but clearly they are related to the things that are alive right now. And again, we're still just building up for you to understand his theory. So none of this is gonna be on the exam yet. But are there any questions? And Jessica, we're still gonna get back to yours later. All right. So Darwin was intrigued by the distribution of organisms on the Galapagos Islands. Like I said, we'd come back to that. And the Galapagos are relevant for a few reasons. First of all, they are relatively young. So, um, you know, they, they came from volcanoes, so literally there used to just be water there. And then because of volcanic activity, we have these new islands. By new, I mean they're much newer than South America, and they're much newer than North America. And this will be relevant here in a second. Um, your book also points out that they're about 900 kilometers or 500 
40 miles off the Pacific coast. And again, that's going to be relevant here in a second. And most of the animals found on those islands are found nowhere else in the world, but they do resemble South American species. So let's put all this together, including what Jessica was asking. So first of all, let's talk about why the age and distance of these islands is significant. Um, so imagine you have all these species on South America. They've been there for a long time, right? Millions of years. And then you have these new um, islands pop up. So what happened was that every once in a while, some species from the mainland of South America would make its way over to the Galapagos Islands. And this is where the distance comes into effect. This is why the distance is important. 540 miles, that's a long way away, right? So things were not just regularly leaving the South America and going to the Galapagos Islands, right? That was a very rare occurrence. It does not happen a lot because it is so far away. But on the flip side, it is also close enough, right? If it was, I don't know, a thousand miles away, they, this wouldn't happen at all. So it's close enough to where stuff could make it from the mainland to the islands, but it's also far enough away for where this didn't happen very often. And this is why we have all these unique animals, and this is why they do resemble South American species. Because even though the Galapagos Islands are unique, like you might have one that's more of a desert, you might have one that's more of um, a grassland, right? Even though they're, each little island is its own unique habitat, they still, these species, resemble the ones in South America. And that's why, because they came from South America. So you might have had one in a, I don't know, that was superb, superbly perfect for, I don't know, a rainforest. And then it comes over here and it makes its way to the Galapagos Islands and it is no longer in a rainforest. It still survives, but it's not perfect for its new environment. And because of that, over time, it changed. And we'll talk about how it changed. We'll talk about how it evolved. But they evolved to match their environment. But again, going back to Jessica's question, and the point of this slide is they originated from here. So even though it may have changed once they got here, it originated from here. The species originated from South America. Now, for the exam, again, I'm still just building up to have you understand how natural selection works. For the exam, none of this will be on the exam. There'll be no questions on this. Are there any questions so far? All right. He gives, um, your book gives some pretty specific examples. There were a lot of examples, but your book only chose a couple. He noticed that the Galapagos marine iguanas had flattened tails that aided it, aided in swimming. And he noticed that they were similar to, but distinct from, the land-dwelling iguanas on the South American mainland. So again, the Galapagos were close enough to the mainland where stuff every once in a while could make it. You know, maybe it got caught up in a storm and made it to the islands. And it happened every once in a while, and that's what happened with these species. So he was familiar with all these South American um, iguanas, and then when he got to the Galapagos Islands, he said, wow, look, these are clearly different but also clear, clearly related. They had come from South America, mainland, clearly, but because they're marine iguanas and don't live in trees like they do on the mainland, they're different. They have these flattened tails. They also have other stuff that you can look into if you want. But the point is, they clearly came from the South America mainland, and they clearly had changed to um, evolve to fit their environment. Um, he also noticed that each island had its own distinct variety of giant tortoise. And I don't remember if your book gets into this or not, but I think these two bullet points are pretty important together. So these marine iguanas, because they're marine, the fact that there's different islands means nothing to them. They can go wherever they want because all those islands are pretty close together. So all the iguanas on all the different islands are pretty much the same because you know, again, they can swim back and forth. So to them, it's nothing. For these uh, tortoises, they're pretty much stuck there, right? The population of tortoises is pretty much stuck on the island. That thing like this is not going to be able to swim over to another um, to another island for the most part. But again, here we are building up to what you need to know and nothing yet that's going to be on the exam. So are there any questions so far? Okay. If you download the PowerPoint, you can watch this little video of some marine iguanas. In my opinion, 
you should look at some documentaries if you want to see stuff like this. I'll actually find some if I get a chance and post them to Google Classroom. There's some great um, documentaries about marine iguanas and the Galapagos Islands. I really, really suggest you watch them because this will reinforce everything I'm teaching you. And more importantly, hopefully it'll give you a little bit of a spark of interest because I admit it, even the best presenter can only make this so interesting. So yeah, I would recommend watching those documentaries. Uh, here's just an example. There's a dome shell tortoise. So if you were into the Galapagos, you could look at this tortoise and say, oh yeah, that must be from the island of Santabella or whatever. You would know because of its, its uh, shell. And then there's the saddleback shell. And again, if you were into the Galapagos and studied it, you would know which island they were from based on their shell. Those are just examples, nothing to know for the exam. So let's talk about his insights, his new insights based off of everything I just taught you. Uh, while he was on his voyage, he was also strongly influenced by a book called The Principles of Geology that was written by a geologist named Charles Lyell. And if you put, download this PowerPoint and click his name, you can get a little bit of a video about him. Um, in this book, this guy proposed and backed up the fact that Earth was actually ancient, not 6,000 years old like uh, a lot of people had thought at the time, and that it had been sculpted over millions of years by gradual geological processes that continue today. So even though he didn't talk about the Grand Canyon, I just think that's uh, just a great example because the Grand Canyon used to just be a river, and the reason it's so deep is because the river has carved through it over millions of years. Um, so yeah. He was influenced by this book, and not only that, he also witnessed the power of nature, natural forces to change our surface. So he was reading about it, but then he also experienced an earthquake. So he was, I think it was off the South American coast, <laughs> if I remember correctly, and they had an earthquake, and he looked, and he had seen, and he had noticed that um, the coastline had, rise, had gone up by one meter. So that's about three feet. So there... As he sat there, he saw the earth change by three feet, which is really a lot when you think about it. Because if you can see three feet in, in an instance, he's thinking, well, yeah, well, how much could it change then over millions of years? And because of all this, this is why this is important, because of all that stuff that I just talked about, he began to doubt that earth and its organisms had been created a few thousand years earlier. So you just have to imagine, again, this is like a, a story, the, the way your book presents it. You know Darwin's background, so hopefully you have an insight to how he might think. And you know the stuff he saw on his voyages. You know how he was influenced and the stuff he witnessed. So it's all coming together. And it all basically boils down to this at this point. Again, he began to doubt that Earth and its organisms had been created a few thousand years earlier. And again, just like everything else I've told you, we're, all, we're still just building up to his his aha moment, so to speak. So, so far, none of this will be on the exam. Are there any questions so far? We've got two minutes left. So finally, you know, it was, a, it was a long voyage he was on, but when he finally got back to England and he was no longer um, exploring, so to speak, he was able to reflect on his observations. He was able to analyze his specimen collection and he did have quite the specimen collection um, and he was able to discuss his work with his colleagues. Again, just a backup story. None of this will be on the exam. And by, excuse me, I'm backing up, by doing all this, by reflecting on his observations and looking at his collection and talking to people, he concluded that present-day species are descendants of ancient ancestors, which they still resemble in some ways. So that was the aha moment. He finally got there and said, all right, clearly, these things that I've seen are related to these fossils that I've seen. Um, over time, these differences gradually accumulated by a process he called descent with modification, which is what we now call natural selection or evolution, excuse me. And he also proposed the mechanism for how life evolves, which he called natural selection. Now there's, we finally got to the moment, this is the most important part. All of that was leading up to this. He came up with natural selection and that's how he did it. All that stuff, all that thinking, all those observations, that's what led him to come up with natural selection. And your book basically states natural selection as um, individuals that have certain inherited traits are more likely to survive and reproduce than individuals with other traits. And this is the perfect place to stop because when we start back up on 
well, I guess Wednesday, because we had the exam on Monday. When we start back up, I'm going to talk about this bullet point and give you a lot of examples before we move forward. So that's it for today. Are there any questions over what we've covered for chapter 13? All right, before I, let's see, I will stop recording and then you guys can ask any questions you might have. Actually, you know what? I'll go ahead and keep recording this because this is for the sake of your um, classmates. Are there any questions at all? Basically, not just chapter 13, but, you know, how the exam's going to work or, I don't know, having extra lectures, anything like that? Do you guys have any questions? So again, the exam is on Monday. It starts at 8 o'clock. It ends at 8.50. The way it's going to start is it's just going to pop up in Google Classroom. So again, this is our first time doing it, but I would assume when it pops up in Google Classroom, so to speak, you'll get an email. So just like every other time I put something on Google Classroom, like an announcement or a PowerPoint or a study guide, you know, you guys get an email for it. So that's the same thing that should happen um, on Monday. Now, I think, and I don't know this for sure either, but I think even though it'll be due at 8.50, I don't think it'll just cut off. So I think if you're taking the exam and 8.50 passes, then it will not cut it off and you can still keep going. So be aware of that because you need to self-police yourself. At 8.50, you need to stop taking the exam because if it says that you turned it in late, I'm gonna have to give you a deduction because this is supposed to be like the other exams, closed book, no notes, no smartphones, no internet, anything like that. And because I'm not there to make sure of that, um, it has to be timed, right? Otherwise, if you have extra time, then you have time to look up all the questions, all the answers to the questions. So make sure at 8.50 you are done taking the exam because if it's late, you'll get a deduction. And that being said, if you do want more time, contact me and we can do what we're doing right now, one-on-one. -on -one. We can do this Google Meets and you can turn your camera on so I can see you and you can take the exam and I'll give you as much time as you need as long as I know that you're not looking things up. So are there any questions on anything? <laughs> 